So it's really my, my great pleasure to uh, bring out a great uh, action sports filmmaker, Mr. Dana Brown, and the most dangerous man on two wheels, Robbie Madison. Thank you. Well, Dana, let's just start by talking a little bit about sort of the origins of this movie, because we saw a little bit in the trailer there. People, I'm sure a lot of people know your dad, Bruce Brown's movies, the original On Any Sunday, and of course, The Endless Summer, which is probably the, the movie's single most responsible for turning people on to surfing all over the world. Uh, and you've sort of, over the, the last years, kind of revisited a lot of your dad's work in different ways uh, with the uh, Endless Summer Revisited, On Any Sunday Revisited, your own Step in a Liquid, which is a kind of high-tech Endless Summer for the 21st century. And so uh, how did you, you come to want to revisit On Any Sunday in this way to sort of uh, see where uh, bikes and motorbikes and everything else on two wheels is in, at this moment? Well, um, On Any Sunday to me is like the high water mark in the uh, action sports documentaries. It was nominated for an Oscar, which imagine this kind of film, that happening. Um, hey, it could happen, don't say anything. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so I got contacted by Red Bull Media House and they wanted to do kind of a mainstream thing that got in the theaters and were wondering what I had in mind. And we talked about different subject matter and they, and they brought up motorcycling. And then they said, what if you did a sequel to Hannity Sunday? And I said, well, why don't we call it something else? <laughs> because in motorcycling it's kind of like you know you have the New Testament and you go I found another chapter like there's people not going to be happy about that but they kind of convinced me to do it and I talked to dad and he said I, yeah I think it's time and the more I thought about kind of my career I thought you know like you said I, I don't do movies on purpose to exploit or capitalize on his thing we have similar sensibilities yeah. etc and I thought God, well, you know he's going to be 77 uh, my mom passed away a few years ago. Nobody lasts forever. And I thought, wow, it's a good opportunity to maybe continue a legacy and, and give a salute to the reason I even wanted to make films, which was seeing the original On Any Sunday when I was a kid. And here we are. You know, and I, I knew the story. It's a great world. So, you know, here we are. Well, how, I'm just wondering, like, you know, when you set out, how much did, how much did you already know about, you know, just how much the sport had changed in 40 plus years, technology wise. I mean, it's amazing some of the bikes in the movie and, and what people can do with them. I and mean, how much of that was a discovery process about, you know, what the film would cover, who would be in the film, that sort of thing? Well, I'm, I'm a fan of motorcycling and I, I follow it and I ride. But um, I didn't, uh, the co writer on the movie is a guy named Scott Russo, who was editor at Cycle News. And I brought him in just for him to describe to me. Not so much the different disciplines, but the different people in the disciplines. Right. So every segment could kind of show a little different shade of the color spectrum in, the, in this pa shared passion. And uh, as I got into it, you know, first of all, the talent of guys like this is unbelievable. And the cameras have gotten so much, but everything's ex really just blown up in the ability. But the spirit of it remains. I mean, this sense of family, this shared passion, this thing that's passed on from generation to generation, like many shared passions. So I thought, well, this is pretty bitchin' because you have something that's going to look completely different, but at its heart, it's the, the heart beats the same. So it, it was a discovery. It, I kind of expected something, and I think in a lot of ways it exceeded kind of my wildest expectations. And, and Robbie, can you talk a little bit about how, how you became involved? Did you already know Dana, or did he, did he look you up and, and sort of pitch it to you? Well, uh, it, it just kind of uh, it happened authentically, and I think that was what the beauty of it was, because nothing was forced. And, you know, it's one thing that I'm about with my jumps is, like, I, I'm happy to put my life on the line, but it's got to mean something, and it's got to have, like, a... I have to be connected to it, not not only you know my heart, soul, my whole being. It's it's you know my life on the line. So I was actually already working on a project with Skull Candy, and and uh, when Re Rebel Media House came to us and said we're doing another on any Sunday film, I was like, yeah, and <laughs> and like and we want you to be involved. I was like, yeah, let's do this. So I was I knew of Dana. I, I'm a fan of his father's work, and the original Only Sunday is obviously a cult classic in motorcycling, and it makes you want to go ride your motorcycle. It doesn't matter how you ride a motorcycle, 
whether you just you know ride around on your little brother's pit bike it makes you want to do that it's like no matter how you ride bikes i i feel it doesn't matter what level you're at it's always fun because it kind of it takes you out of the you know the endless chatter of your mind and you're able to just kind of focus on something for a minute and you get a break from hearing the voices and, and you're, you're able to kind of like really just experience life in the moment and um when i got the call up to say hey you know we'd love to have you involved in the film it was just a pure delight and and as we move forwards you know i was able, able to make a small project into a bigger project and to get the publicity and the coverage that we're getting with this film is 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 amazing and to meet you know a nice little guy like this he's become a great friend of mine and his family's amazing and I'm a big fan of their work and just their 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 lifestyle, their ethic, you know, their relaxed approach. It really kind of transcends through the film, and so it's it's been it's been a blessing, you know, to, to be able to. It, it meant even more to me to go and do this jump once, you know, once on any on any Sunday was a part of the, a part of the stunt as well. It just it meant so much more to me. It made it a lot more. At first, I, I really thought that this jump. It felt like I was missing an element, and this definitely filled that hole and, and made it so much more. Well, we have a, a clip of you from the movie, so let's take a look at that, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. I actually thought it could be interesting maybe for, for both of you, actually. I mean, you, uh, Robbie, talk about it a little bit in the movie, but for people who haven't seen it, just sort of how, what your entry point was into motorcycle culture and motorcycle riding and motorcycle racing. Uh, you know, I mean, I think we, we sort of all start out on a, on a bike with training wheels and we lose the training wheels. And for some of us, that's, that's about where it stops. <laughs> and others, it becomes uh, something much bigger. Yeah, for me, I've, I've always felt some sort of uh, energy about me to prove myself. And uh, I had a bigger sister that used to beat me up when I was a kid, so I think that might have had something to do with it. But, uh, you know, I just, I was born to young parents, had me when I was really young, and I was kind of just left to my own devices. I used to, like, walk the bushlands when I was, like, four or five years old and just, like, go hunting by myself and catch lizards. And, I mean, I was, like, left to my own devices. And not that they were, it was, it was a great thing, you know, really kind of, it definitely set me in a direction that gained momentum pretty quickly. And I remember when I was, a really little kid, I went to get my first motorbike and I was just a little guy and the, the guy at the bike shop said to my dad, I don't know if he's, you know, big enough and tough enough to ride a motorcycle and he turned around and I was eating a lemon and he's like, okay, he's eating a raw lemon. Yeah, he probably <laughs> could do this. <laughs> and so it's just been one thing after another. I've, I've had a lot of injuries, but um, there's just been that inside of me, there's been that little kid with a dream who wants to jump mountains and, and, and do crazy things on a bike and... I let it go to rest when I was 16. I had a viral meningitis, a viral encephalitis, was on a deathbed. And when I came out of that, something inside of me just said, you know, you've got one opportunity to, to follow your dream. And I went and watched a motorcycle event in a local, in, in Sydney. And there was some of my friends were in the show. And I was like, man, I, I got to get out there and try it because I know I'm better than these guys. And it really started off as a competition thing. But once I got past that, it's really become something that's it's part of my being you know I'm, it's it's and that's why i say like i do these for authentic reasons because it's it's life and death you know like jumping off a 10-story building it can go horribly wrong and you know in the film i jumped you know length of a football field and dropped 20 stories and you know one breath of wind or an oversight in a certain direction can take you down and it's been uh you know, motorcycles has consumed my life, and I, I mean, it's it started from the first the first injuries. Now it's a file at the hospital as, as big as my arm, and they definitely know me. <laughs> and, and for me, like Robbie was talked about in the original on any Sunday, there was no real evil can evil was not profiled, etc. Somebody said, "What about the stunt guys and the freestyle guys?" And I went, "You know, that's good, but this is really about." heart and soul and spirit and then I met Robbie and we talked before I decided to do it and he's such a sweet guy but he's kind of obviously a little bit bananas <laughs> and and I was talking and it's like I've ridden forever but I don't understand what motivates you to go oh there's a building this would be fun we'll figure out if I can drop off of it you know why why on earth would you do that and I asked him I said you know is this something you acquired? Because he has these long answers, and he goes, well, when I was three, I was on a big wheel. He goes, and he pauses, he goes, oh, this was the first time I fractured my skull. The first time he fractured, it was at three years old. He just drove the big wheel off. 
there, there's a gene that's so unique. So on the, on the, he's got all this spirit and soul, yet he wants to do this stuff that the rest of us just go like, there's, you couldn't pay me enough money to try that. I don't care how many accolades you have, how much people slap you on the back. And, and I love that. We've become really good friends. And it's like, I still don't understand it, but, but, it's fun, but it's really fun to tell their story, you know, his story. Well, one of, the, one of the really charming things in your dad's movie was that Steve McQueen was in the film. We saw Steve McQueen riding BMX bikes on the weekend with a bunch of non-celebrities, just like a regular guy. And then, you know, you have some celebrities in this film, like Mickey Rourke, who also just sort of blend in to the crowd. There's this kind of great democracy of bike riders. And uh, I, I'm sort of curious because this film is so much more high tech in many ways than your dad's films. And it's filmed all over the world in high definition with this incredible Dolby sound mix. You know, so how, how important was it for you to kind of preserve that, that human element at the center of it, w despite all these bigger bells and whistles? Well, I, I think that's the most important thing because you can approach a project and go, look, we have all this technology available to us now. So we don't really have to try. We're just going to show people all these really cool things. And that's really not the case because they can go spend the same 11 bucks at the theater and see universes blow up and Matthew McConaughey do something and, you know, you're kind of up against it. So you, you have to find that story and the fact that there's all these kind of stories and heart. And, and I think anybody, whether you give a crud about motorcycles or not. I mean, people I identify with having a passion. I mean, obviously, a lot of people here have passions about computers and things, you know. So it, it's, you know, but this is just a little more visual. And to be able to capitalize on, uh, on the 4K cameras and to be able to capitalize on, on the partnership with Dolby doing this Atmos mix. And, you know, that's never existed for this type of film, where it was affordable to kind of make it seem like a $100 million film when you don't have to spend a hundred million dollars, you know. So, well, uh, talk uh, talk a little bit about somebody that that we're going to see in a, in another clip. But but before we see this, uh, another one of the subjects in the film, Ashley Fiolik, and and how you found her, and and sort of what makes her unique to this world. Well, Ashley's a multiple time uh, women's motocross champion, and she was born deaf, and I knew she was very cute young gal, incredible racer. And uh, I was talking to people about her and her relationship with her, both her parents. Yeah. But her pop travels with her and stuff. And, uh, you know, I just kind of called him up and said, you know, would you like to guys go on a trail ride? I'd, I'd love to do a, a father and daughter thing, thinking, well, that's a little bit of a switch. A and just make it real visual. And they were, s you know, so incredibly nice. And I just thought Ashley represented something you wouldn't expect. You know, she probably stands all, how tall is Ashley, about five foot two? Yeah. Yeah, weighs about 105, soaking wet, d deaf her whole life, and can kick anybody's ass on a motorcycle. And, and, smi and just is smiling all the time. And I thought, you know, that's what movies are. You don't, uh, in essay, you know, what, what you do, Scott, sometimes you have to tell somebody, here's what I think, here's what you should think. In a movie, you just go, here's kind of an unbelievable story, and I don't have to draw conclusions. I just point out, the story, you know, the love of a father and a daughter, the, the bonding over a motorcycle, and the fact she's overcome, you know, this handicap uh, without overcoming it. I mean, she's, yeah. you know, it's just, so that, that, that's where Ashley came from. Yeah, so let's, let's take and a look at that, at that and clip. she's cute. <laughs> uh, there's, there's another quite remarkable friendship in this movie, which is between uh, Travis Pastrana and Doug Henry. Talk a little bit about that. Well, T Travis Pastrana's, uh, you know, a legend. You know, he's raced NASCAR, and he's a rally car champion, and uh, he's got his Nitro Circus show on uh, MTV and all this stuff. And, and I met Travis a few years ago, and he's genuinely one of the nicest guys in the world. And Doug Henry's his boyhood idol, and Doug mm -hmm. um, paralyzed himself racing from the waist down. And uh, we were trying to find a place for Travis in the movie because I think he just re represents, you know, kind of all that's positive because he's really a genuinely great guy, great family guy. And uh, they're both East Coast guys. Uh, actually, I'm on the East Coast, so now that they're both from your guys' neck of the woods. Um, 
And, you know, I said, well, you know, well, what if you guys get together, which they do. And so, yeah, Doug came down and they went riding because Doug's built a motorcycle that he can completely control his hands. And, and, and again, I think it, it kind of shows two things. You know, it, it shows this, e even though which motorcycling can be really dangerous, you know, but that passion overrides whatever happens and this friendship that the, these two people have, you know. Well, and also it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful because uh, there is so much like high technology in this movie, but in a way, Doug's contraption is, is, is kind of like a mad scientist's homemade invention, you know, of how he could keep riding in, in his condition. It's a wonderful. So we'll also take a little look at, at that and then talk a little bit more. Did, did you go in the foam pit? <laughs> no. So here's a good one. I, I'm at Red Bull Media House talking, and we're about to go to Travis's house in Maryland. And all these Red Bull executives, no offense, because some of my favorite people are from Red Bull, are going, don't let Travis get you in the foam pit because this guy broke his ankle, this guy got cut, all this stuff. So don't, hey, Travis is going to try to talk you into going in the foam pit. Don't go in the foam pit. So we get there and we're shooting it. And, and I jokingly say to Travis, I said, I'm not going in the foam pit. And he goes, I'd never ask you to go in the foam pit. And I went, well, all these other guys got injured and stuff. And he goes, yeah, those guys, I don't like those guys. <laughs> So I guess they came and like, hey, hanging out with Travis. Travis goes, hey, dude, I got a good idea. Let's go in the foam pit, like to try to weed the people out, I guess, a little bit. But, so I felt kind of in there because Travis didn't make me go in the foam pit. <laughs> now, uh, this is a question, and maybe, maybe Robbie can comment on this too, but you, you, you uh, narrate your own films. We, we heard that a little bit there. Your dad did that. He, he used to do live narration to, to, to films uh, back in the day. And um, you have captured a certain folksy, um, self-effacing quality I very much. I think I'm quite sophisticated. It, I, can't the, I guess the, the question is, is, uh, uh, is, does that come naturally, or, or did you have to, to practice that, to, to that, that sort of no, when wry I was humor? When I was making Step into Liquid, we actually made the whole film, the rough cut, without any narration. Yeah. It was just told second person. And, uh, you know, we ran a couple tests, and it just... It was difficult to go from one section to the other. We thought some of the audience was missing some of the, the points, and somebody goes, well, you have to narrate it. And that was the last thing I wanted to do, because I thought, geez, everybody's, you know, Dad set the bar so high. And, and, and then I did it for Step, and the first time in the sound booth, you know, I did the first, like, my name's Dana Brown, and I'm a surfer, and they play it back. And I sounded so much like my freaking dad, which I did you don't know how you sound. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great, you know. No, it's just natural. I've done, I just do my movies kind of, it's, it's how, it's not something I, I'd love to do it in another way. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Although I did do Toyota ads. I was the voice. This is money in this, if you got a voice. <laughs> but I, I'm not a professional narrator. It's just kind of, they're personal stories and it kind of makes sense. It also establishes a point of view for the story that I'm not the omniscient narrator going, this is exactly how everything is. I'm not Morgan Freeman. I'm just this. <clears throat> well, I kind of am Morgan Freeman you know, every other Friday. But, you know, I'm just this guy. This is, I, I'm just telling you a shaggy dog story that maybe you sit down and watch. I'm not trying to be the expert of experts, you know. So it kind of serves a purpose to give the movie a point of view as well. Um, Robbie, we saw you hobble out here a little bit. Um, so I assume there's... There's not uh, uh, another jump in your immediate uh, future, but what are you dreaming of these days? What's yeah, I hope the that because Dana attacked me this morning. <laughs> and uh, no, I had surgery on Friday, but uh, I'm working on a couple of projects. I have one project close to heart. I've been working on it for two years, but uh, it involves motorcycle, it involves water. But um, yeah, I'm just trying to keep it under my hat for now. Um, I haven't really... Uh, we've had some huge success. We haven't recorded anything with Guinness Book yet because we're just trying to really find out exactly what it can do but I have some big dreams for it and hopefully you guys will see it soon and and uh, Dana have you given thought as to you know since you've kind of exhausted uh, your dad's filmography now what might be the next uh, the next step for you I'm just gonna start making sequels of my own movie you know, <laughs> 900 years later um, I, I've thought about a couple things I mean on this kind of thing we finished we didn't really finish the mix till July, and then you got to go out and promote it. And um, but there's some things I'm considering. You know, I, I'd like to do maybe some shorter format stuff before I do the next feature. Right. But um, 
it's kind of like I'm going to survive this and hopefully it goes good starting on Friday and, you know, people want to hire me again. That's kind of where I'm at. Well, I'm going to turn it over in a second to the, to the audience for some questions, but we, we have one more uh, clip from the movie to look at, which is a, a, a sequence uh, involving custom uh, custom motorcycle designer called Roland Sands. And so we'll, we'll take some questions for now uh, for these guys, if there are some. Awesome. Um, my question is for Robbie. I imagine... There must be some fear involved in what you do, or at some point there must have been fear involved. I, I, just from that clip of you going up to that arch and like coming back down, was there a moment of like terrifying fear, or have you moved past that? Is it more an energy that excites you? I mean, kind of what goes through your head when you do these huge things that you do? Well, I'd like to joke about it, but it's like it is what it is. I, I honestly, I, I am fearful. Fearful when I did the jump on the Arc de Triomphe. Um, I started going through the motions of it um, probably about a year before and uh, I jumped the football field successfully prior to that and Red Bull said to me, hey, that went off so great, you know, it was such a huge success for us, what, what's next? And straight away, like just normal thinking, I was like, oh, you know, let's, let's put row of tanks in there or let's make a football uh, soccer field, it's a bit longer. And I was like, no, nah, that's what Evil Knievel did, I want my stuff to be like interesting and different and I, I said you know there's something that needs to come out but I don't know the answer right now so I'm not going to give one and if the time passes and I don't give you a, an answer with, when you need it well then I just feel that everything happens for a reason I just like to stay in the flow so I kind of just said well you know I'll get back to you if, if I come up with it and one day I was driving down the freeway and I was doing about 70 mile an hour and I looked over it there's a holiday inn off the 405 in California and passing the, 405, passing the holiday inn at 70 mile an hour I was like with the right ramp at this speed, I could just tell I would have jumped right over the building. And I was like, there's the idea. So I called the guys at Red Bull and I'm like, I've got a great new idea. And, and honestly, that's how it went. But I had to commit to that jump. You know, after we had some talks and we talked about how to practice it and all this and that, I started, I committed to it. And when I started kind of envisioning like being in Las Vegas and going off this ramp, like I was going weak at the knees, uh, like my heart was pounding, I was cold sweats, and I started listening to everyone else's opinion and, and no one had anything positive to say, like <laughs> no one around me thought I was in my right mind and even my trainer was like, man, I think you bit off more than you can chew because I don't, and he's a professional guy, someone I look up to is a legendary racer and so I kind of really started questioning myself and it, it sent me on a bit of a journey of like finding out who I am and what I'm about and it really made me commit to my heart and soul and, pa and that's why I say I'm passionate about things because I have to be to believe in it and it's what I had to discover to be able to follow through with this and literally like when I went to the practice setup they had a 10 story building made out of scaffolding in the desert and I walked to the top of it and that was literally like when I've heard the saying you go weak at the knees I literally went weak at the knees dropped to my knees and threw up and I was so fearful I was in tears I was shaking and I didn't know if I want to go through with it and I just felt like it was the biggest pressure in the world and you know, I just kind of thought, well, I'm in a hole. I got to dig my way out of this. You know, and and um, and I just feel that like everything happens for reasons, and I and I really truly believe in that. So, I decided that I was going to do it because it was it was a childhood dream of mine to be able to get a platform like this and be able to show the world something that I'm what I do and what I'm passionate about. And I decided that if I was to kill myself during the process, well, then that was just how I was meant to go. So I just fully committed to it, and I was so terrified and fearful, but I just took each day as it came and. You know, I did some soul searching and, you know, I've, I end up being able to, I end up just being able to be at peace with however it ended up. And it made me train my butt off and I got really strong and it was the best physical shape I've ever been in. And I kind of, on the night, I, I had this confidence about me that I, I knew I was going to make it. And there was nothing to really solidify that. I just felt it inside. And I think once you go to those depths and those extremes to commit to something and it, it like brings out this nature in you and I, I've spoken with the with the marines and the special forces guys and done some work with those and they're like that's exactly what we need to get out of our guys for them to go into battle and go to these extreme places so we kind of was able to kind of like understand a little bit more once I work with those guys and uh yeah it's like I, I'm fearful you know and, and when I do these jumps it's um it's exactly why it has to make sense because I have to commit to it and it, it's really becomes like a matter of life and death and I'm cool with that. But yeah, I'm, at no means I'm not fearful, but there's a point where you can listen to the negativity or you listen to the positivity and your mind always wants to throw at you the, the negative ways. And 
I feel no matter what venture you do in life, you know, even if it's going for a job opportunity or something that you really believe in, there's always a way of listening to the negativity and, sh you know, shortchanging yourself and, and walking away from an opportunity that you could have hung in there and, and maybe got through it. And so it's, it became powerful for me. It became a, a, a prerequisite and it allowed me to go and do the Jumping Corinth Canal. It didn't quite get as much publicity, but it was way crazier. And, and it's allowed me to do a lot more things in my life just from this philosophy and what I've understood. And even the jump that we did on any Sunday, it was, it was something that I'd never practiced for. I kind of you know, opened my big mouth and said, yeah, I'll do it. And then I like, got, the, got to the morning, I was like, oh, what do I get myself into? And there's definitely fear going on. But when it comes to the point of going off the jump, I'm able to just turn that mindset off, turn that negative, like the, the chatter off and just stay in the moment. And I really just, there's like a running order of things I pre-check and one of them is Mother Nature. And I, you know, I'd check the wind and I'd, you know, kind of, listen to the energy and all that crazy stuff and uh and it's you know i have a way of figuring it out but yeah I, I mean it's uh it's not like i'm fearful or some superman i just have a way of figuring it out and i've stayed com i've stayed committed to something that has been a childhood dream of mine and able to do some stupid things that probably should have got killed doing them <laughs> how do you physically train like to drop 20 stories or to fly across a physical, I mean, across a football field? What are you doing in the gym? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, I'm, I'm only training for the best case scenario. Like worst case scenario, if something mechanically goes wrong or I make like a huge error, well then there's no amount of training that can save you from that one. You, you're done, you know, and, and that's like the reality of it. So I just train to walk out of it in the best case scenario. and. Jumping a football field still has a lot of, you know, impact, and I've, you know, I've had back surgery, I've ruptured my lumbar spine, and blown out a couple of discs, and, you know, so I've been through the battle scars and and worked out like what I need to do to get through it. But um, I to answer the question, like physically, I do a lot of core work. Um, so I do pretty much at the end of my, like when I get to true fitness, I stand on those the round boasted balls and I stand on them and do all my workouts standing on it. So it's like a lot of balance, a lot of, I mean, it activates every single muscle. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of uh, fast twitching stuff. So like, you know, bouncing on trampolines with my eyes closed, juggling tennis balls and throwing them against the wall. So you just kind of get that awareness, like a kind of enhancing that seventh sense, you know, of like being able to see without ceiling and being able to feel things and feel the energy. Cause you know, there's, there's energy around and you can feel it if you really like harness into it. And I've been able to form a relationship with like my soul and you know, it's got all the answers when you want to listen to it. And I, I have a, like a really kind of crazy spiritual guy that I go and listen to and you know, I've, there's rhyme and reasons to certain things. And you know, it, it seems like a really distant at first, but the more you kind of, when it's your only lifeline, you're able to kind of figure it out. And it's been, uh, it's been something I've grown a lot from and you know, it's something that I hope to come back to soon and I mean every time I go to a jump like this I really have to kind of deep dive back into that pond it's not something I do every day but leading up to a big jump it's like it's my lifeline I, I really need to focus on it so it's um and as much as it is physically there's a there's a spiritual dimension to it as well and I, I'd spend a lot of time trying to meditate you know so I try and take like an hour hour a day to just like turn the mind off and sit in silence and it might sound wacky or weird but it's 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 hard to do you know and uh, an hour is is a long time with no thought but it really kind of brings a whole stillness about you and, and it, make, it enhances your senses, you know? You go from that to um, listen to the BS that people talk and you can really like decipher what's, what's good and what's bad. So it's, um, it helps me like kind of stick to my path and stay on track. Is your passion driving motorcycles or doing stunts? Uh, my passion is, um, is living life, you know? It's, uh, Motorcycles for me is a paintbrush, you know, and I feel like I'm an artist. And but yeah, I love riding motorcycles. I love surfing. I love so many things. And it just happens that motorcycles my avenue where I can earn money. And you know, men's got to eat. <laughs> so this question is for Dina. Um, obviously, your dad did the film, and now you've done it. Has he seen the film? And what did he think of it? Yeah, he's. We sent him. Um, he's, he's executive. In the movie. Yeah, he's in the movie and he's executive producer. So when we started, you know, I kind of laid out what we had in mind. You never know until you do it. I thought Robbie was going to be like six foot four and real handsome. And that's you. That's all you. Yeah, that's me. You're right. The, um, 
No, so it becomes a journey. You find out Robbie's Robbie, so you want to show that story. So I showed him that, and uh, we went and shot it, and we, we'd send him rough cuts. I, I shot the, uh, we edited the film in, uh, in Canada, and I'd send him rough cuts. To, but he didn't see the whole finished product till the international premiere in, uh, at the San Sebastian Film Festival in Spain um, about a month ago. And he's stoked. Now he's like, he is the Hollywood premiere. He's going next week to Spain, uh, to Santa Barbara to the local deal. He's like, he's like the biggest uh, supporter of it, which, you know, honestly, at the top of the list besides hoping the audience likes it. I mean, he's, you want to make sure he's proud. So, yeah, as far as I know, he's on board. Uh, Robbie, Dana, I want to thank you so much. I want to encourage people to see Dana's other films, Step in a Liquid and the wonderful Dust to Glory about the Baja 100. And uh, thanks. And, and on any Sundays in theaters uh, Friday, right? Yeah. Go see it. Just You, you can buy a ticket. You don't even got to go see it. <laughs> thanks, thanks for everyone for having the time to listen to us. Thank you. And thank you to Apple Soho. <laughs>